Well, welcome to the stream. Um, this is a review of the DRZ V2, which is has been a long time coming. I've done some mini reviews so far, but um, I finally got my thoughts together on the chassis and the family of cars that is the DRZ. Um, and had the time to finally get this review done. So um, let's jump right into it. Um, this is a DRZ V2, as I said earlier. Um, I'm running a DAS micro uh, receiver, which is compatible with the NB4. That's proven to be pretty decent, um, but the size is just phenomenal, as you can see here. Um, I'm running an Ensotech uh, ESC here. Um, so in case people are having trouble understanding what I'm what I'm saying, it's the Ensotech. Um, most of my cars run them. Um, I do love those ESCs, especially with the uh, the reprogrammability. Uh, that's actually a feature I use quite a bit. Just to dial the cars in, um, I don't like doing it all on the remote side. I'd rather get the ESC dialed in and then just do the final tweaking or tuning with the, uh, the transmitter. Um, it just gives you a bit more accuracy and uh, a bit more granularity, which is kind of nice. Um, I'm also running a hacker slider uh, gyro. Not too happy with that. I can see why some people like it, but it behaves differently to every other gyro I've used, and I don't necessarily like that. Also running an Ensotech 3500KV V2 motor uh, with the sensor cable. Um, it just gives me a bit more control at the uh, when I'm at the low end of the RPM range. Um, and if you're doing slow speeds drifting, that's where you need a lot of control. So. The other thing to note is that I've managed to route the motor power cables, as you can see there, all the way underneath this gold carbon fiber plate and then have them come out the end here and into the ESC. Uh, this was a bit difficult, but it's been worth it. The reason I do it, however, is if you have a look at that, yeah, like there's nothing going above this copper plate. Like the power controller normally sits there, so it's pretty low. It's mainly just the ESC, and unfortunately, I've got the button at the top. But with this ESC, uh, there's no mechanical cutoff from the battery. And if you just turn the ESC off, it will drain the battery and permanently damage it. So you probably want to be taking the body off anyway and disconnecting the battery. And this is a good way to remind me to do so. So that's pretty much what I've done. Well, I guess the only thing that's different in this setup is uh, I'm not using an atomic servo, but I'm using something that is near identical to the atomic servo. And I suspect the atomic servo is just a rebrand of that. So if you're looking for it online, it is this. Oh, let me just twist it. Oh, I didn't realize it was high voltage. I might actually bump up the voltage in that case. Uh, I just buy these off Banggood. They're fairly expensive, but not as expensive as the, um, the atomic ones and they're easier to get in bulk uh, from uh, Banggood than they are compared to uh, Ato um, Atomic slash Miracle Mart. I've had a lot of issues with uh, Miracle Mart but we'll go into them later if I actually feel like talking about that. Um, basically the servo is the same dimensions, the same speed, everything is near identical so um, I'd rather go for the cheaper option in that case. Um, yeah so let's start talking about the back end first and the reason i want to talk about the back end is because the back end on all these uh, drz cars is near identical let me just grab a super skater to show you so there we go it's a bit hard to tell at this angle uh, let me just grab a pointing stick. We'll, we'll use my screwdriver because i like my screwdriver so these bars are different um, the shape's almost identical um, I think this one probably has a tiny bit more height, but this has also got two rows of uh, screws, so if you want to use the longer shocks. But I think the important thing is the uh, the diff housing here and the diff housing here are identical. Uh, all the way back to the powertrain and how they're connected and down here to the spur gear. That's all the same across all the, uh, the DIZ models. So um, the only real difference on both of these cars is that the... The front end differs quite a bit and I'll definitely dive into the differences between the two of these shortly because it's actually interesting and I think the Super Skater is actually better uh, in, in than the V2 for some things. So let's get that out of the way. Um, now the back end, there's a lot of variability in these back ends. Um, the Super Skater one is great. Um, my DRZ one was good. I'm actually using the diff from my original DIZ rather than the diff that came with this, with the V2. And that's because I polished that one and shined that up and that 
worked really, really well, but the one that came with the V2 had a lot of spur on it, so little plastic parts uh, that would end up catching and causing issues. And so I, I go with, I went with the much smoother one. I also had some, um, what do you call it, atomic diff grease in there. Not too much, not enough to cause it to be a limited slip diff, but just enough to uh, assist with um, the rotation. Like, it just made everything roll a bit smoother. Um, what else is it? There's not really much to talk about. I, I do get some binding. That's normally when the motor or the battery is running a bit low and also if the motor's been running for more than five minutes. I don't know if it's just that the motor is losing power because the battery can't provide it because I've damaged, I've used these batteries quite a lot and they're probably a bit damaged by now. Or if it is just that everything is heating up and it's causing a bit of extra pressure here or in the gears behind here that causes them to bind up a bit. Uh, I'm still investigating that. I'm not counting it against Atomic at this point just because I haven't determined if it's me or if it's them. Uh, most of the back ends have been pretty easy to build and pretty decent. I'm just realizing how good the video quality is. So I'm, I'm, I've got one light there, one light there, and then I've got a light over there that just illumin illuminates everything. And uh, it's doing wonders for the lighting. It's making this car look really, really good, which is awesome. Yeah, awesome. You know, it's I just don't have enough room there to give a thumbs up, but I hope you know what I mean. Cool. Uh, moving forward in the car, as I said, I, I put spent the time to put the cables underneath there. Originally, I was going to put them on top. Um, if I did it again, I would. Because of this metal plate here, um, that allows you to adjust the length, uh, it just means there's not a lot of room for the battery. And the battery does swell during usage, so it get goes from being tight to almost impossible to remove, and you have to let the car cool down. Um, nothing major. I should probably be using better batteries, but as I said, I've been using those for a while, and they've probably been a bit damaged, and they probably need to be replaced anyway. Um, in terms of triple A's, uh, I mean, I, I use the Nano Tech Cells. Um, unfortunately, I've got to do a resolder job on this one, but that's that's simple to do. Uh, and I put these plugs in all of them. So um, these are the batteries I normally use, 300 milliamps. Um, I just recently did pick up a whole bunch of triple A's. Uh, this is mainly for the MAO, MA030 or when I'm doing a playing around with the MR03 or with just a stock build with no mods. Um, I get a lot of questions about the lithium ion batteries, so I just wanted to show people what they actually do look like. As I, when I say, I always tell people they're blue and they sometimes have markings and they sometimes don't. And as you can see, they're blue and these ones do have markings. Cool. Back on topic. Let's get back to why you're here. Now, the front end. Um, I did say I think the Super Skeeter is better, and I want to go into why that is the case. So let's just elevate that a bit. I'm going to hold one of the wheels in place, and then to show you how much wiggle is in that wheel. That's a lot of wiggle, and that's a good side. So if I go to the other side, this wiggle is even more. And more important, look at that arm there, and look at how much wiggle is in the arm itself. And then if I go back to the other side, you can see the arm doesn't wiggle at all. So it turns out that the uh, hole drilled through the metal is not straight, but is actually canonical. And this seems to be a theme with the recent Atomic um, cars, in that I think they're not maintaining their tools properly. Um, the plastic has a lot of spurs, which sort of indicates to me that the edges of the metal um, cast, or uh, I've forgotten the word and I tend to do that a lot, but um, the metal casing that they force all the plastic into, um, over time that actually wears out. And when you do that, you get sprue or that bit of plastic that's stuck up. And going through here and having to shave down a lot of parts, I did notice a lot of that sprue that I had to clean off with the scalpel or not, uh, and other things. So. Uh, it was most noticeable on the back end, so I think that's why the first DIZ back end I've got was good, which was probably about six months to a year ago, and then the Super Skeeter wasn't bad, and then this one's even worse. I've, I've noticed a decline in quality, so I don't think they're maintaining their tools either on, on the plastic side or on the metal side, because um, the tolerances weren't the best in some places. Um, and, and that arm twitching all over the place is really really bad now you might say why don't you just get some aftermarket 
metal parts for it. These are actually the metal parts. Uh, I took the BZ3 uh, swing arms and um, or A arms, yeah, A arm connectors or something like that, and put them on here because the plastic ones actually deformed even further. Um, and the fact that the left and the right uh, have different characteristics, so this side's fine, this side bends quite a bit. Um, that is also another same theme. It seems like one side is always fine, the other side always has worse tolerances. So nothing major. I actually don't know if that impacts the drifting performance. I, I'm not enough of a rear-wheel drifter to really be able to comment further on that. Um, it's just one thing I've noticed. Um, you may have seen me review, do a mini, mini, or mini review of the GLF and uh, the B2B trike. Um, that GLF, I didn't even do any polishing. I just put it together and it was as smooth as this one was after I did all the polishing. So but once you do get the suspension set up, just like look at how smooth that is. So um, The shocks, I had to shave them down and get rid of some extra plastic as well. That's fine. They work incredibly well. Just using the default wheels. There's some trickery around this uh, front uh, retaining um, clip for the body. The This plastic bit at the back is a really, really bad design. The screws they say to use are too short, and so you can see I've put a longer one in on one side, and that's really, really helped. But this is fiddly. This is stupidly fiddly. Like, it should have, you should have been attached from the bottom and not from the top, because this suspension plate gets in the way. So really, really bad design there. Um, kind of annoyed about that, but... Um, that's fine. Um, I think what we'll do now is dive into the manual. I do quickly want to go over the tools I used. So my trusty screwdriver, and I still consider this to be one of the best screwdrivers I've ever owned. Absolutely love it. Um, pair of tweezers, not required, very useful in some scenarios. Definitely want, to, want one of these, just a standard scalpel. Um, I use it to scrape the plastic away like that. Um, absolute lifesaver. Scrape away the plastic, then you sandpaper it down. Don't try and sandpaper it down, it'll take too long uh, and you'll end up deforming the parts of the uh, suspension you don't want to. Um, I keep a diamond file and a steel file. Um, I found that the steel file is just a bit more aggressive and useful on some parts and the diamond file is better on other parts. So the other thing I use is a body reamer. Now I'll get into where I use this later, um, but it's normally used on the servo because I had to thread a screw through the servo and the, uh, the hole wasn't the right size. And there's a technique for that I'll show you. Uh, if you don't have one of these, uh, you can just insert this in into the hole and just rotate it and that will also cause it to uh, have a bit of a camera on the side, um, which just makes centering the screw and forcing the screw in a tiny bit easier. You don't want it to be straight and then go too wide, you actually want it to just feed in nicely and then cut into the plastic. So, uh, Cool, um, I will go into the Super Skeeter quickly, so just have a look at the arms and how much movement you can see here. So the movement's in the wheels, and I probably haven't tightened these up properly, but you can see that these arms at the, at the top here don't move at all. So. I wasn't in too impressed with this when I got it, but I think it's more that I just don't know how to rear wheel drive drift properly and I need a bit more tuning. Um, I did have to add some extra weight and at least during training, this made a huge difference. So the only other thing that's worth noting is I'm running the Eagle Racing shocks on the back here and I still consider Eagle Racing to have some of the best adjustable shocks. Um, but that's a completely different story. Uh, Super Skid has been pretty good, even in the, I think, this is the 90mm configuration. It's just got a lot more room, um, although I did have some issues with uh, servo clearance in the front there, so um, it turns out the servo setup on this is a bit weird, and I had to do a lot of filing that caused some additional damage, so we're not going to see this any further. If you want a review of this, leave a comment, and I'll consider doing one and getting some more time on it. Uh, it's also worth noting that, actually... Uh, just let me see if I've got the scales, because people always ask about how much does this weigh. Oh, I had the scales around here earlier. Where did you go? Scales, scales, scales. So we're at 14 minutes, so I'm going to have to really blitz through this. 
hence the name. Come on, zero out, there we go. So the Super Skeeter, with a battery is 145 grams. And do I have a spare battery? I did a moment ago. Actually, we'll just pop the battery out and reuse that one. And that one is 125 grams. Now the Super Skeeter does have probably about 15 grams worth of weight on it. Um, but this is a much nippier car, I can assure you. And this one also seems to have a lot more aggressive steering on it. Um, I think on the Super Skeeter that's related to the, uh, the issue with the front shocks, but I picked up the Monoshock for this. And providing the front end isn't too different, I'm going to try fitting the Monoshock to this to see if that fixes the suspension issues. Um, and if it does, then honestly the Super Skeeter is probably still a better, is probably going to be a better build. Okay. So, uh, I did want to quickly go through the manual, because uh, there's a couple of gotchas, and that's where some of the value is. So just give me a sec while I hide some windows, because when I did the first run of this, I accidentally ended up putting a whole lot of information in front of people that I didn't want them to see. Uh, like what tabs I have open, for example. Okay, so uh, that step straight forward. This part here binds on this pretty badly. So I actually put sandpaper on the inside and widened it a bit. And that took quite a bit of effort. Um, the other thing I've noticed is people use different screws here. I know BMR 3 used slightly bigger screws to what I did. Actually, let me take a quick look at that. Um, it's important what they mentioned about clearance. It does have to be perfectly flat because there is not a lot of clearance above that when it's fully assembled. Um, but yeah, shave the inside, get force uh, and put it on, but don't force it. Uh, if it doesn't fit, shave it down a bit more. Spend as much time as you need. Like you may spend half an hour on that, but trust me, it's an hour well spent because carbon fiber, when it's that thin, um, it doesn't bend and then break. It just all of a sudden snaps. And so you might not realize you're putting too much force on it until it's too late. Uh, and if it does snap, um, because you use that hole to provide a lever action, you'll actually find you've got on one side of the turning, you actually end up putting force on the other side to the one that's broken and you'll end up snapping that and lose your steering. So pay attention, be careful, use the right screws and you should be fine. Um, same here, I had to shave the inside a bit to get the bearings to go in. It can be difficult to know which bearings to use. Now I'm somewhat blessed in that I bought um, an excessive amount of bearings off Banggood a while back, as you can see here. Um, so I just picked and selected until I found something that worked. But basically the bearing should be sitting flat on both sides. Um, it seems obvious from this side, but I went with a slider, slightly thicker bearing on the bottom, and later on I had to swap that around, so the thinner flush bearing was on the bottom and the thicker one was on the top. The top one doesn't need to be flush, but the bottom one does because otherwise it pushes this all up and then you have the top binding. And it's the same reason for why you want the screws flush. So just keep that in mind. That's fairly straightforward. I thought the steel collar was a bit weird, but hey, whatever. Like I would have used a bearing with a smaller inner dimension, but um, I haven't checked for that. I think they use the same bearing throughout uh, the car. Which would be really, really nice because unfortunately they use about five or six different types of screws and that really annoys me. Um, two to three screws max, um, please. Not a whole bunch of different screw sizes. And the screw packet that they give you is not just for this DRZ V2. It's also for a whole bunch of other cars. So you will end up with a lot of screws at the end there, um, which is annoying. And yeah, no wobble. Um, but... I'm not terribly concerned about the no wobble there. There's not like, I mean, this front setup has so much wobble in it anyway that any wobble you introduce here is going to be significantly less than what you do here. Um, this is fairly straightforward. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I think I did have to shave the ends off these balls, um, but you won't know that until you go to put this fl uh, front plate on and then screw it up. Um, basically, you get to the point where you screw these in, then you lift the arm and then let it go and it should always just fall to the bottom without binding any at any point in time. There's a lot of pictures online or a lot of videos online on how to do that. I'm not going to go into that because this is already a long video. We're at 20 minutes already. So These I wouldn't really bother about getting exactly the same length because you can adjust it later. Um, I find this annoying. I really wish they had measured from the outside. 
I went and checked their previous manuals and it turns out in all their other previous manuals, manuals they do measure from the outside. So it seems weird that they've swapped to the inside. It just gets very, very fiddly to measure from the inside and from the outside it's relatively easy to do. Um, but once again, it doesn't have to be too accurate. You're likely going to be adjusting it later anyway. Um, this is metal on metal. So you do probably want some thread lock in there just so that when you unwind this, you don't accidentally unwind that, which actually has less friction than that. Um, the last thing it, you want to do is uh, unthread here rather than there because it will just vibrate around and cause more wobbling on the front end. Um, you can omit these set screws and I would because if you do it causes too much binding. Um, I find that this rod is actually retained by this these two plastic spaces and won't come out on its own so this is not required. But as soon as you put this in that causes that to bind. And unfortunately, this plastic part doesn't rotate on that. It um, actually binds on this. And so you actually want this to be free moving through there, which this would actually prevent. Um, the trick for this is to actually have the, uh, the black part off, um, thread the rod through that side, push the little white spaces over the top, then thread the rod back until the uh, spaces are flush against this black part here. And then what you do is you just take the back side of uh, the tweezers, as you can see here, and I'll just sw swap that. Just take the back side there, and you just push, it, put it in here, and then push down so that the top of that is flush with that side of the pin. Oh, actually, sorry, I just realized I could bring. So you put the, the tweezers in here, and you push the pin back until it's flush with the top of that, and then you slide this entire assembly with that and that, and the pin hanging out there, over the top of this yellow part, and then you start applying pressure and then it should feed itself through without too many issues. If you push the pin in that way and then try and feed them through the top, um, it's very, very difficult. It's very hard to maneuver these parts once they're in there. And these parts are actually smaller than the black parts. So you actually do need to put tweezers in there to tweak it around and it's very difficult. So it's much easier to get the white parts centered using the pin and then just slide everything on top. Um, I don't think camber or, or caster adjustment makes that much of a difference because the tires are hard plastic and they're rounded and so because they're rounded it doesn't matter what angle they are they are at the uh, contact area will always be the same so this is more for looks than anything else. Um, feel free to disagree with me let me know in the comments because that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Um, once again like these are the parts I replaced with metal and this one here on this side was the one that moves around quite a bit because I was using metal I actually Loctited that but if you're using the plastic part still Loctite it because you want that part to go in and out not that part um, and the Loctite will help prevent that uh, nothing too strong I just use the uh, the red which may be blue depending on the country you're in it seems that the uh, the colors I have here and the colors in the US are completely the opposite of each other so basically you want the stuff that is easy to, easy to come out you don't want it to bind too hard uh, the front knuckles are brass. I didn't think that'd make a huge difference to be honest, but there's just so little weight on the front end. Um, and after having put brass on my Mini Z 4x4 and seeing the difference that made, um, I'm kind of glad they actually did make those out of brass. Um, there's not really much to say. The, the quality of them is pretty good. Just put the bearings in before you screw the holes in. And if when you're it's possible for the ball ends that go in here to actually bind or compress the bearings. And if that's the case, you have to shave down the bottom of the ball head so that they don't touch the, uh, the bearings when they go in. Um, otherwise, you'll have front wheels that don't spin. Uh, can you see it? They don't spin freely like that. You'll find that they'll spin one or two times and then bind to the same point every single time. So. Oh, it's kind of nice having the camera and the lighting down perfectly. It really makes this a lot simpler. This screw, uh, I found binds on the inside of the wheel. Can I show that? Possibly. Uh, in there. It might be a bit hard to see. You can probably see it's very, very close. And let me swap over to the big screen. And maybe if I twist... Yeah, you can see how close it is there. I actually had to file that down because it was binding. Um... If, it, if I did this again, uh, I'd actually just leave this screw part off 
Uh, the reason for it is it actually doesn't do anything. Um, you would think that it helps limit the left to right throw of the vehicle so it doesn't overturn. The problem is that there's other parts that interfere with the suspension way before that and the only time it ever actually does take effect is if the wheel is slightly depressed and if that does kick in like that for example um, the entire front suspension is going to bind anyway so I don't think it actually saves you from anything and it actually makes the build a bit more complex. Once again disagree with me put it in the comments so other people can um, know what your thoughts are. I'm not necessarily right, and I'm still look. I, I still learn things of other people, especially people that are new to this hobby. So, yep, yeah, go and write those comments if you feel like it. Um, the wheel shaft has a hex bit in the back, so if you've got a hex piece like that, you can flip the car over, rotate the wheel out like that, put the hex bit in the back like in the end like that, and you can see I can rotate it. And then you can do your, your wheel nut stuff on the top. Um, if you don't do that, it becomes very, very difficult to do. And if you're looking at the back there, um, once again, we'll see if we can get a close-up shot of that. If you just take an initial look at that, it's hard to tell that there's actually a hex bit in there. If you wear glasses or use a magnifying glass, the outer surface is actually round, and the hex doesn't start until you get a bit further in. So, yep, just an FYI, there, it is actually a hex bit on the back there. Um, this step's pretty simple, just make sure you don't over push the ball heads onto there and have it resting against the brass bit. Um, if you do, this is where the tweezers work really really well and this is where you probably want um, tweezers with a bent head like that because what you do is you force it underneath, oh, is it possible to see? Probably not. Basically you get underneath the ball cup and then just lean it back and it will just pop it up. Which is really, really really nice actually I just realized I'm on the wrong scene again so yeah so you literally put the tweezers there and there underneath the ball the cup and then just force it down and it pops up like that uh, aluminium bridge plate is fine but because I've got the cables underneath uh, can you see that let's get back to the big screen again it's probably a bit hard to tell but I've got just around there the blue cables going there they actually bind on the battery a bit, so I kind of wish the aluminium H plate was a bit smaller. Yep, we're right back almost immediately. These are the diffs I'm I had issues with. I actually put metal shims there and on the other side there, and then just filled it up with a um, like a light grease. Um, I wasn't going for limited slip diff or anything like that. Um, I've tried that before. The problem is that under high speeds, even with the lip on the inside of that, if you fill this up with grease, it does tend to leak out and it gets very, very messy to clean. So I've well, to clean off. So I've just got enough grease in here to lubricate all the parts, and that made a pretty significant difference. Um, you probably do want to file down and get rid of any spur, uh, spur there. Um, I just actually recommend building it and then holding it in place and then just twisting it and seeing if it catches anywhere. And if it does, going back and fixing it. Um, and once you've done, make sure you use the right screws. Uh, I Well, actually, maybe don't use the right screws. I used slightly larger screws because the screws that they recommend actually bit in and removed the bottom part of the plastic there when I over-tightened them. So you want a screw that just fits into the hole here and then use those ones. Um, these ones are right. These ones, I think, are specified to be a bit too small. And with these spurs here, uh, with the spur gear, are they spur gears? With the gears here and there, um, I did have to clean off a whole lot of spikes on the end there, so clean them up with a scalpel, then just run some sandpaper over them, and you'll probably spend a lot of time tweaking this, and honestly, it's worth it. The smoother this runs, so if this, if this runs without catching and you can't feel any friction or any binding in it, that's when you know you've done really, really well. And at that point, you put the metal, like what, just a 0.1 mil metal spacer on the inside there and on the back side of this one, just because it's slightly lower friction, um, grease the entire thing up, assemble it, and when I'm talking about greasing it up, just enough to cover the inside and a bit on the gears on the, the inside. You don't need all that much, you just need it to be lubricated. And yeah, uh, looser screws. The screws they're talking about are these screws. Um, these ones shouldn't cause much of an issue when they're in, but if you do have any binding, even after screwing these ones, back these ones out. But try and avoid backing these out too much the the 
atomic plastic is not the best and every time you screw and undo it uh, it causes a tiny bit more damage just like on the uh, the mini tees um yeah so if these are over tightened this won't rotate and just back them off these don't need to be too heavily compressed and, and actually if anything these need to be out by half a mil um, i haven't worked out a good way to space them but um there is an issue where the not the whole like the width of this spur gear is actually not enough for the um the rear end and at the top of the rotation um it actually does look like it comes very very close to popping out so when you put the gear in and we're going to skip to that because the rest of this stuff is pretty straightforward uh, when you put the gear uh the rear diff here make sure you put spaces on the inside because there is quite a lot of play like almost up to a mil of play so Putting 0.4 mil worth of spaces on either side and making sure it's centered is not unusual. And you can make it make sure it's centered by looking at the bottom. Like there's a little gap here and you can just eyeball it. It's not particularly difficult. So we're going to go back and I want to touch on one other thing. We're at 30 minutes now, so we're almost at the limit for this video. But here we go. Make sure you put this pin in. Uh, it's very easy to miss. Uh, if you don't, that gear there will not be driven and the car won't move forward. And if you realize this once the car is built, it's very, very painful to disassemble this and go and put that back in. So just an FYI on that, there is a pin there. It's very hard to see because of the way they've orientated it. They really should have made the pin come in from that direction. Um, bum, bum, bum. This is all straightforward. I've actually left the screw off before. There hasn't been an issue. Um, this, these rear arms, I actually make the, uh, the rear <clears throat> the screw come out to be flat with that but I, I'm not a rear wheel drifter so I haven't done a lot of rear wheel drifting so um, I might have to adjust that later but that's easy to adjust after the fact so it just sits in in there you just put a screwdriver in the top there like so and then you can twist it left and right to back it in or out and you can visually see it by looking at the bottom so in fact, that's why the uh, carbon fiber kicks out the uh, sides here, is because that's where the down stops are. You will have to shave the ends off this. Um, I did find that this was binding, and it wasn't binding on the outside of this. It was actually binding end to end. And you can feel that when you put the back metal plate in there. It'll go to push it in, and it'll go in, but then it won't snap down um, like here very, very easily. So shave a tiny bit off the end. Just a couple of passes with a thousand grit sandpaper each time and then once you're happy you give it one or two passes with the three thousand grit paper and just put it on and as long as you can push it up and it just drops down under its own pressure under gravity um you've hit the, the mark with that uh, this was straightforward again another pin be careful but that's easy to see uh, these screws are hard to access um, put the screws in before you lower, lower the bulkhead down it'll make your life easier um this is straightforward yeah there this one doesn't have the binding issue like the front because there's just so much plastic there so you don't have to worry too much uh make sure you pick the right screw for that um that has to go in as far as possible because there isn't actually a lot of room there yeah. if i swap to a different scene will that work yeah uh let's work out how do i orientate the car yeah so you can see over here for example it's there's oh there we go not a lot of room there so you can still make a bit of a mistake but you want to get it uh, all the way in if you can uh i don't like this step i don't like having the cut parts but that indentation makes it simple um these screws you do have to be careful with this plastic is so small and these screws are so tiny that too much force will cause this plastic to pop out and then this rear you'll have one wheel that's a bit wigglier than the other. Um, not a massive issue because it is the back end, but still not ideal. And actually, as I'm looking at it, I'm noticing that that wiggles a lot more than this side. Well, maybe not. Either way, I don't think that's a problem. The, the back end, um, a bit of slop there doesn't matter as much as the front end. Uh, don't over tighten these is probably my, my advice. You'll need a... Um, Hex piece on either, or uh, hex screwdriver on either side, which makes things difficult. Um, 
but the lower arms are very particularly fragile and over tightening will cause the uh, carbon fiber to snap. If you're using the long arms, you could possibly use the, the top slots here, but I actually ended up putting them in the bottom slots and just backing out the um, uh, amount of travel. So, oh, sorry, the amount of preload. Actually, I don't even know if these are the long arms. I think they are, but that's all right. I'm probably a bit too soft on the back anyway. Uh, a lot of spare on here, clean that up. Once they move in and out and you don't have any issues with uh, airflow causing it to dampen, um, that's when you know you've done it perfectly. Uh, you don't want the air to dampen this. You actually want the grease that you end up putting in there to dampen. Um, so the best way is you sandpaper it down until it goes in and out without any, like, any resistance whatsoever. Then I pop the end into grease and I twirl it around and I scrape some off. Then I push it into the shock and then I use a tissue to clean up any extra. Then I put, take that back out, put the spring on top and then um, put the, uh, the shock back on top there. Nice and simple, nothing to worry about. Uh, this is straightforward, I'm not really gonna comment on that. Uh, this is a bit annoying because you have to push that way and then push the screw back on that way, but nothing too painful. Um, once again, back end of the uh, tweezers. You just put it in behind there and then force it that way and it makes life a lot simpler. Uh, servo, so this is where I end up uh, normally using uh, a screw bit. Um, as you can see, I've got like one of the Mini-Z big uh, hole drillers. I actually use a much smaller hand tool than this because uh, this is too big, but I um, force it through the hole here um, and enlarge it just slightly so it's a bit smaller than the screw then I either put the scalpel in and just um, take the edge off the uh, the side I'm screwing into or I'll use a reamer like that although this is somewhat dangerous this is actually a safer method um, and just make it so that it's a bit of a cone in the top and it just means it's it guides the screw a bit better and gives something the screw something to bite into um, you actually do want the hole to be a bit smaller than the screw, um, otherwise it just won't be retained. And if you get to the point where you can, it keeps on screwing and it never gets tight, um, that's actually fine. The reason for that is you'll find it won't come out easily, uh, so you don't have to worry. You, you want the screw to be retained, you don't care if it moves around in the hole too much. Um, so that's pretty simple. Uh, this is a pretty awesome setup. Uh, this is a bit fiddly. This is where tweezers helped a tiny bit. Um, a bit of uh, Loctite or Vaseline on this screw makes it a bit easier to stay in place. The Vaseline, I'd, I'd actually recommend Vaseline. The Vaseline means that you can let go of this ball cup and it stays attached to that, which you will be moving your hands around a bit. So that's pretty simple. Uh, I'm using the 90mm body mount, so I actually excluded those. Um, but these are pretty good because you can hang a rubber band off there to hold the battery in place. And that's about it. So you can see the different configurations. I'm using the 90mm. 90mm is a bit too tight, in all honesty. I can only just fit a battery in there. Um, there's not a lot of space, um, but I've managed to make it work. Um, I did a lot of soldering, and I, don't, I, I spent an hour or two just pre-measuring the wires before I actually cut them. And I actually put the... The, the motor had the cables in, so I did the motors, wired it all up, then move the cables around here and then while this was all glued and taped up I then soldered them in. That's not the best way for someone who's new to this um, but it does allow me to get very very accurate cable placement. I've got an, enough, I've probably got like 10 years soldering experience so it was easy for me to just avoid everything and solder it in place like that. In fact I'm just looking for my soldering iron. No I can't see it. That's fine. Uh, and then that's it, you just add out electronics. If you actually omit this um, battery bit when you're in 90 mils, it does allow you, it does give you a bit more room for the electronics, which is why I did it. So that's it. <clears throat> um, that is the ins and outs of the DRZ-V2. Um, do I like it? Long dramatic pause. It wasn't bad. It's not the best kit I put together. Um, GL racing kits are just so much better in terms of fitment, part accuracy, better plastics, and the amount of 
fiddling and tweaking work you have to do with it. This car is great once you do, if you go through every single step of uh, using the sandpaper, cutting it back with a scalpel, doing the fit and finish, making sure everything, every part works together really, really well, then it's great. The only problem is there are other cars out there <clears throat> where you get that without the hassle that um, Atomic introduce. As I said, I don't think Atomic are fully maintaining their tools. And at this scale, um, accuracy counts. Um, I, I, it, it's hard to say. I don't have a lot to compare it with. So the Super Skater, definitely better. But that's also a, an Atomic chassis with an HRC upgrade on it. Um, I do have the GL Drift on order. And once I get that and build that, I'll actually be able to give you the full verdict as to where this stands, but I'll tell you now that I highly, <coughs> highly suspect that the GLD is a much better drift car. Um, I tried to get my hands on a BMR X, um, which is a front drive, uh, a front motor rear wheel drive car that was rather unique, but they're particularly difficult to get my hands on at the moment. Um, it would have been nice to have something to compare against. If you're prepared to put the time into this and you like model building, this is probably the car for you. Um, if you're new to the hobby, uh, most of the other drift cars are a bit cheaper, uh, better quality and easier to put together. And in the case of the GLD or the GL racing cars in general, they tend to give you a, a really, really good servo to begin with and uh, fairly good el electronics. Um, I know you can get this with electronics, but I, I've got mixed feelings on the uh, atomic electronics. Um, Although they are small, I actually use it in the, um, the B2B uh, wheeler. So, I guess the way of putting it, this isn't a bad car, it just requires a lot of fine tuning. That may not be for everyone. I don't mind building these cars. Tuning drives me absolutely insane. Um, I'm still learning to drift, and this car has proved to be a fairly competent drifter. Um, the advantage it does have over the Super Skeeter is it does have more angle at the front. And I suspect if I went with the Monoshock, I'd get even more. Um, I haven't quite gone to that point yet because I need to learn to drift properly before I go there. Um, yeah, so I guess that, that's my conclusion. Um, I don't know if that's a good or a bad conclusion, but yeah, if you don't mind tuning, probably a great car for you. If tuning is annoying and you don't have like the full set of tools like this, um, Oh, I just realized I used a file on my table accidentally and then can put them away. Uh, then this may not be the car for you. Um, make sure you put a competent set of electronics in it, um, but you're going to have to be very, very careful about fitment. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, if you do have any other questions, let me know in the comments below. This has been less of a review and more a everything you need to know about how to build this vehicle, so that's all right. Um, but if there's enough need, I might just do a five minute review on it. Although I don't think people will really want a five minute review if they've made it to this point in the video. So there is that. Um, I am working on shorter format videos. Um, so if you have a preferred time, uh, let me know. And I plan to do some more streaming so that I can have live Q and A sessions. But, um, it turns out there's a lot of people in Europe and, uh, the U S that are very, very interested in the videos. And unfortunately being GMT plus 10, so in Sydney, Australia, makes that particularly difficult, um, especially considering I like to sleep in, which is US afternoon. So we'll have to work out how we can um, do something in that regard, but uh, expect some news on that front um, in the near future. Cool. Uh, with that, I'm going to leave you guys and let you get some drift time in uh, or grip racing time or whatever you do for fun. Um, and feel free to make gratuitous demands of me in terms of reviews and questions and insights on your part in the comments. Have a good one and I'll see you at another time.